Hey, fourth graders, Mr. B. I've got Lucy and Tumnus with me, and we're going to be back with more of The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Bellairs, and it's chapter 8 today. The next day, Jonathan was helping Lewis rummage in the front hall closet for his ice skates. Lewis had weak ankles, and he was terrified of falling down on the ice, but he had decided to try to learn to skate. If he got good enough, he might be able to worm his way back into Tarby's favor. He had never seen Tarby ice skate, but he was sure that the team's greatest home run hitter would also be the champion ice skater of New Zebedee. He probably could sign his name across the ice of Durgy's Pond. So Lewis and Jonathan threw warped badminton rackets, raccoon coats, galoshes, and picnic baskets into the hall. Finally, Jonathan came up with what looked like a short aluminum ski for a midget. It was a beginner's skate with two little ridges for runners. This it? That's one of them. Thanks a lot, Uncle Jonathan. Now all we need is the other. As they went on searching, Lewis said, in what he thought was a casual way, uh, Who's living in, that old in the old Hanchet house? Jonathan stood up suddenly in the closet and banged his head on a shelf. When he'd stopped rubbing his head and wincing, he looked down at Lewis and said, rather sharply, Why do you want to know? I, I just wanted to know, said Lewis shyly. Once again, he wondered what his uncle was angry about. Jonathan stepped out of the closet with the other skate. He dropped it into a pile of clothes. So you just wanted to know, eh? Well, Lewis, there are some things it would be better for you not to know. So if you'll take my advice, you'll just stop poking around where you're not wanted. There's your other skate and... And good day. I have work to do in the study and I've already wasted enough time answering your foolish questions. Jonathan got up abruptly and stalked off to the study. He had slid back the doors with a loud clatter when he paused and went back to the closet, where Lewis was still kneeling, with tears in his eyes. "'Please forgive me, Lewis,' said Jonathan, in a tired voice. "'I've been feeling really rotten lately. Too many cigars, I guess. As for the house across the street, I hear that it's been rented to an old lady named Mrs. O'Meager. She acts kind of crabby, or so I'm told. I really haven't met her, and I just didn't want anything bad to happen to you. Jonathan smiled nervously and patted Lewis on the shoulder. Then he got up and walked to the door of the study. Again, he stopped. Don't go over there, he said quickly, and then he stepped inside and slammed the double doors. Hard. Lewis felt crisscrossing lines of mystery and fear and tension hemming him in on all sides. He had never seen his uncle acting like this, and he wondered, more than ever, about the new neighbor across the street. So, I'll stop for a moment and think, who could that new neighbor be? Who do you think it is? Who do you think Lewis might suspect that it is, but maybe doesn't want to admit it even to himself? Hmm. Okay, well, we'll keep that one in mind, and we'll see if that's the way it turns out or not. One night, during the week before Christmas, after a heavy snow had fallen, Lewis was awakened by the sound of the doorbell ringing. Bring! Bring! It was not an electric bell, but an old, tired, mechanical bell set in the middle of the front door. Someone was turning the flat metal key, grinding the stiff old chimes around. Bring! Lewis sat up and looked at his bedside clock. The two luminous hands were straight up. Midnight! Who would it be at this hour? Maybe Uncle Jonathan would go down and answer it. Lewis felt cold just thinking of the drafty front hall. He bundled his quilt about him and shivered. The bell rang again. It sounded like a whiny person 
insisting on some stupid point in an argument. No sound from Jonathan's room. No waking up sounds, that is. Lewis could hear his uncle's loud, steady snoring, even though there was a thick wall between their rooms. Jonathan could sleep through an artillery bombardment. Lewis got up. He threw back the covers, slipped on his bathrobe, and found his slippers. Quietly, he padded down the hall and then down the dark star staircase. At the entrance to the front hall, he stopped. There was a street light burning just outside the front gate, and it threw a bent black shadow against the pleated curtain on the front door. Lewis stood still and watched the shadow. It didn't move. Slowly, he began to walk forward. When he reached the door, he closed his fingers around the cold knob and turned it. The door rattled open, and a freezing wind blew in over his bare ankles. There stood his Aunt Maddie, who was dead. Lewis stepped back as the old woman, her head cocked to one side as it always had been, tottered across the floor toward him. A shaking blue light filled the air around her, and Lewis, his eyes wide open in this nightmare, saw Aunt Maddie as she had been the last time he had seen her alive. Her dress was black and wrinkled. She wore heavy shoes with thick heels, and she tapped her bunchy black umbrella as she went. Lewis, even though he, he or Lewis even thought he smelled kerosene. Her house, her furniture, and her clothing had always reeked of it. The white fungus blotch that was her face shook and glowed as she said in a horribly familiar voice, "Well, Lewis." Aren't you glad to see me? Lewis fainted. When he awoke, he was lying on his back in the cold hallway. The shaking blue light was gone, and so was Aunt Maddie, though the front door was open. Skitters of snow blew in over the worn threshold, and the street lamp burned quiet and cold across the street. Had it all been a sleepwalker's dream? Lewis didn't think so. He had never been a sleepwalker before. He stood there thinking for a minute, and then, for some reason, he shuffled out onto the front porch and started to pick his way down the snow-covered steps. His feet were so cold that they stung, but he kept going until he was halfway down the walk. Then he turned and looked at the house. He gasped. There were strange lights playing over the blank windows and the rough sandstone walls. They wouldn't have been strange lights at midday in the summer, but on a December night they were eerie, for they were leaf lights, the shifting circles and crescents cast by sunlight falling through leaves. Lewis stood and stared for several minutes. Then the lights faded, and he was alone in the dark, snow-covered yard. The chestnut tree dropped the light dusting of snow on his head, shaking him out of his trance. His feet were numb and tingling, and he felt, for the first time, the cold wind whipping through his thin pajamas and his half-open cotton bathrobe. Shuddering, Lewis stumbled back up the walk. When he got to his room, he sat down on the edge of his bed. He knew he wasn't going to get back to sleep. There were the makings of a fire in the fireplace, and he knew where the cocoa was kept. A few minutes later, Lewis was sitting by a warm, cheerful fire that cast cozy shadows over the black marble of his own personal fireplace. He sipped steaming cocoa from a heavy earthenware mug and tried to think pleasant thoughts. None came to him. After an hour of sitting and sipping and brooding, he plugged in the floor lamp, got John L. Stoddard's second lecture on China out of the bookcase, and sat reading by the fire until dawn. The next morning at breakfast, Lewis saw that Jonathan was red-eyed and nervous acting. Had his sleep been disturbed too? Jonathan had not discussed the break-in or the car chase or the Izzard tomb with Lewis, and Lewis was not about to bring up any of these subjects. But he knew that something was bothering Jonathan, and he also knew that ever since the night of the break-in, Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman had been holding midnight conferences. He had heard their voices coming up through the hot air register, though he had never been able to make out what was being said. 
He had thought a couple of times of hiding in the secret passageway, but he was afraid of getting caught. A passage that is entered through a china cupboard full of rattling dishes is not as secret as one might wish, and if some secret spring lock snapped shut on him, he would need to scream his, his way out, and then there would have to be explanations. Lewis almost wished that something like that would happen because he was sick of his secret. He was sick of it because it kept him away from Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman. He always felt that they were watching him, waiting for him to break down and tell them everything. How much did they know? Christmas at 100 High Street was both good and bad that year. There was a big tree in the study and the glass balls on it were magic. Sometimes they reflected the room and sometimes they showed you ancient ruins on unknown planets. Jonathan gave Lewis several magic toys including a large pink Easter egg, or Christmas egg if you wish, that was covered with sparkly stuff and what looked like icing, though it couldn't be eaten. When Lewis looked into the egg, he could see any battle in history. Not the battle as it really was, but as he wanted it to be. Though he didn't know it, the egg, like the balls on the tree, was capable of showing him scenes on other planets. But it wasn't until he was a grown-up man, working as an astronomer at Mount Palomar, that he was able to discover that property of the magic egg. Jonathan did a lot of other things that Christmas. He put candles in all the windows of the house. Electric candles, not real ones, since he liked the electric kind better. And he put strong lamps behind the stained glass windows so that they threw marvelous patterns of red and blue and gold and purple on the dark sparkling snow outside. He invented the fuse box dwarf, a little man who popped out at you from behind the paint cans in the cellarway and screamed, Dreeb! Dreeb! I am the fuse box dwarf. Lewis was not scared by the little man, and he felt that those who scream dreeb are more to be pitied than censured. Needless to say, Jonathan put on a very good show with the coat rack mirror, though it had a habit of showing the ruins at Chichen Itza over and over again. Somehow, the mirror managed to pick up radio station WGN on its beveled edges so that when Lewis went out the door in the morning, he heard the Dow Jones averages and livestock reports. Lewis tried to enjoy himself that Christmas, but it was hard. He kept thinking that Jonathan's magic show was meant to cover up what was happening to the house. What was happening was hard to figure out, but it was strange and terrifying. After the night when Lewis saw, or, or dreamt he saw, his Aunt Maddie, the house seemed stranger than it ever had. Sometimes the air in certain rooms seemed to shimmer as if the house was going to disappear in the next second. Sometimes the stained glass windows showed dark and terrifying scenes, and sometimes Lewis saw in the corners of rooms those awful sights that nervous people always imagine are lurking just outside the borders of their eyesight. Walking from room to room, even in broad daylight, Lewis forgot what day it was, what he was after, and at times almost forgot who he was. At night he had dreams of wandering through the house back in the 1890s, when everything was varnished and new. Once or twice Lewis woke from such dreams to see lights flickering on his bedroom wall. They were not leaf lights this time but rags and patches of orange light, the kind that you see in the corners of an old house at sunset. These strange things didn't go on all the time, of course, just now and then over the long cold winter of 48-49. When spring came, Lewis was surprised to see that the hedge in front of the Hanchet house was wildly overgrown. It was a spirea hedge, and it always had bristly little pink and white blossoms. This spring, there were no blossoms on the hedge. It had turned into a dark, thorny thicket that completely hid the first floor windows and sent long, wavering tendrils up to scrape at the zinc gutter troughs. Burdocks and elanthus trees had grown up overnight near the house. Their branches screened the second-story windows. Lewis had still not seen much of the new neighbor, 
Once, from a distance, he had caught sight of a dark, huddled figure rattling a key in the front door, and from his window seat he had seen her passing to and fro on the second floor. But aside from that, the old woman had kept out of sight. Lewis had figured it would be like that. She did have visitors, though. One visitor. That was Hammerhandle. Lewis had seen him coming away from Mrs. Omega's back door late one night, and twice on his way to the movies in the evening, Lewis had literally bumped into Hammerhandle, who was huddling along High Street toward the Hanchet house, his shabby overcoat buttoned up to the neck. Both times, Hammerhandle had been carrying packages, odd little bundles wrapped in brown paper and twine, and both times they had collided because Hammerhandle kept looking behind him. The second time they met this way, Hammerhandle grabbed Lewis by the collar, the way he had before. He pressed his unshaven muzzle to Lewis's ear and growled, You little snip! You're looking to have your throat cut, aren't you? Lewis pulled away from him, but he didn't run. He faced Hammerhandle down. Get out of here, you rotten old bum! If you ever try to do anything to me, my uncle will fix you! Hammerhandle's la Hammerhandle laughed, though it sounded more like he was having a choking fit. <laughs> your uncle, he said, sneering. Your uncle will get his sooner than he thinks. The end of the world is at hand. Don't you read your Bible like a good boy? There have been signs, and there will be more. Prepare! And with that, he stumbled on up the hill clutching his parcel tightly. The day after this strange meeting was cold and rainy, and Lewis stayed indoors. Jonathan was over at Mrs. Zimmerman's, helping her bottle some prune brandy, so Lewis was alone. He decided to go poke around in the back rooms up on the third floor. The third floor rooms were generally unused, and Jonathan had shut the heat off in them to save money. But Lewis had found interesting things up there, like boxes full of chessmen and china doorknobs and wall cupboards that you could actually climb up inside of. But of course, I'm hoping Lewis was smart enough that he knows not to close the door of the cupboard once you're inside of it. Like Peter and Lucy and Susan. Edmund, not so much, right? Lewis wandered down the drafty hall, opening and closing doors. None of the rooms seemed worth exploring today. But wait, sure, the room with the parlor organ. He could go play it. That would be fun. One of the disused parlors on the third floor had a dusty old parlor organ in it. It was one of the few pieces of furniture that was left from the time Isaac Izzard had lived in the house. Of course, there was a parlor organ downstairs, the good one, but it was a player organ, and often refused to let Lewis play what he wanted to play. This one up here was wheezy, and in the winter its voice was only a whisper, but you could sometimes get good tunes out of it if you pumped hard. Lewis opened the door. The parlor organ was a bulky shadow against one wall. Lewis found the light switch, and the light came on. He wiped some dust off the seat and sat down. What would he play? Chopsticks, probably, or from a wigwam. His repertoire wasn't very large. Lewis pumped the worn treadles, and he heard a hissing and puffing that came from deep inside the machine. He touched the keys, but all he got was a gaspy, tubercular sound. Darn. He sat back and thought, over the keys was a row of black organ stops with labels that said things like Vox Humana, Salicet, and Flute. Lewis knew that these stops were supposed to change the sound of the organ in various ways, but he had never pulled any of them out. Well, now was the time. He grabbed one of the black tubes and tugged gently. It wouldn't budge. He wiggled the stop and pulled harder. The whole thing came out in his hand. 
Lewis sat there staring stupidly at the piece of wood. At first, he felt bad about breaking the organ, but then he looked more closely at the stop. The end that had been in the organ was blunt, smooth, and painted black. There was no sign that it had ever been hooked up to anything. What a cheesy outfit, Lewis thought. I wonder if they're all like that. Let's see. He pulled out another. Pop! He pulled them all out. Pop, 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 pop. Lewis laughed. He rolled the black tubes back and forth over the keyboard. But then he stopped and thought. He had read a story once where a car had had a dummy dashboard that came out so you could hide things behind it. What if this organ... He got up and went downstairs. He went all the way down to the cellarway where Jonathan kept his tools. He opened the toolbox and took out a screwdriver, a hammer, and a rusty butter knife that Jonathan kept there for prying things open. Then he went back upstairs as fast as he could. Now, Lewis was sitting at the organ again. He scanned the long wooden panel. Seven round black holes stared back at him. There were four screws holding the panel to the organ case, and they came out easily. Lewis stuck his fingers into two of the holes and pulled. The panel was stuck. He thought a bit, then he picked up the butter knife and slid it into a crack. Streak! A little eddy of dust rose and tickled his nostrils. He moved the knife along to the right a bit and pried again. Streak! The panel flopped out onto the keyboard. Ah, uh, now we would see what was what. Lewis bent over and put his head close to the hole. He could smell a lot of dust, but he couldn't see a thing in there. Turn it! He'd forgotten to bring a flashlight. He reached in and felt around. His arm went in all the way up to his armpit. He groped some more. What was this? Oh, paper? He heard a dry, crackling sound. Maybe it was money. He grabbed hold of the bundle and drew it out. His heart sank. It was just an old pile of papers. Lewis sat there staring at them in disgust. So this was the secret treasure of Izzard's castle? Some treasure. Well, there might be something interesting in them. Like secret formulas? He flipped through the papers. Hmm. Hmm. He flipped some more. The light in the room was very weak and the old paper had turned practically the same shade as the copper-colored ink Isaac Izzard had used. He figured the writing must be Isaac Izzard since the first sheet said, Cloud formations and other phenomena, observed from this window by Isaac Izzard. Hadn't Mrs. Zimmerman said that she had seen old Isaac taking notes on the sky? There were dates here and entries after them. Lewis read a few entries and his eyes opened wider. He leafed some more. A spatter of rain hit the window. Lewis jumped. Outside he could see thick masses of blue clouds piled up in the west. Through them ran a jagged red streak. It looked to Lewis like a hungry mouth. As he watched, the mouth opened and a ray of blood red light shot into the room. It lit up the page he was holding. On the page, were scrawled these words. Doomsday not come yet. I'll draw it nearer by a perspective, or make a clock that shall set all the world on fire upon an instant. Lewis felt very frightened. He gathered the papers together and started to get up. As he did so, he heard a noise, a very faint noise. Something was fluttering around down inside the organ case. Lewis stumbled backward, knocking over the bench. The papers slid out of his hand and scattered over the floor. What should he do? Run for his life? Or save the papers? He gritted his teeth and knelt down. As he gathered up the sheets, he said to himself over and over again, Kia tu es Deus fortitudo mea. Kia tu es Deus fortitudo mea. I'm sure I absolutely massacred that Latin. Now he had all the papers again. He was about to dash for the door when he saw something come floating up out of the darkness inside the organ. A moth. A moth with silver-gray wings. 
They shone like leaves in the moonlight. Lewis ran to the door. He rattled the knob, but he couldn't get it open. Now he could feel the moth in his hair. Lewis went rigid. His face flushed. He wasn't scared anymore. He was angry, very angry. He swatted at the moth and crushed it. Lewis felt a horrible runny stickiness in his hair, and all the fear came rushing back. He wiped his hand frantically on his trouser leg. Now Lewis was out in the hall, running and shouting, Uncle Jonathan! Mrs. Zimmerman! Come quick! Oh, please! Come quick! I found something! Uncle Jonathan! A little while later, after I'd had a drink and they got to gather around, Jonathan Lewis and Mrs. Zimmerman were sitting around Mrs. Zimmerman's kitchen table drinking cocoa. The dusty papers lay in a heap on the table. Jonathan put down his mug and said, No, Lewis, I, I tell you again, they're nothing to worry about. Old Isaac was crazy, crazy as a coot. This stuff has nothing to do with that ticking noise in the walls. Or if it does, it can't help us any. It can only frighten us. I'd say that was why Isaac left those papers there, wouldn't you, Jonathan? To frighten us to death, I mean. This was Mrs. Zimmerman speaking. She was standing at the stove with her back to Lewis, and she was making a great show of stirring the cocoa. Sure, I'd say that was it, Florence, said Jonathan, nodding. One last trick for the road, and that sort of thing. Lewis looked from one to the other. He knew they were covering up, but what could he say? One thing would lead to another, and before long he would have to tell about Halloween night. When you're hiding something, you get the feeling that every other secret is connected to your secret. Lewis couldn't challenge anyone for fear of being exposed himself. Late that same night, Lewis lay awake in his bed listening to Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman talking. They were in the study below, and, as usual, their voices drifted up the hot air register. And, as usual, he couldn't quite make out what they were saying. He got out of bed and crawled over to the wooden grating in the floor. A warm breath of heat softly beat at his face. He listened. Even now, he just couldn't hear well enough. There was only one thing to do. He had to use the secret passageway. Lewis put on his bathrobe and tiptoed down the back stairs. The kitchen was dark. Good. Slowly, carefully, he removed all the china from the shelves of the china cupboard. Then, he tripped the hidden spring, and the cupboard swung upward. He walked slowly in. Sorry, the cupboard swung outward, and he walked slowly in. This time, Lewis remembered to bring a flashlight. Not that he needed it much. He didn't have far to go, and light shone through many chinks into the cobwebbed passage. Before long, he was standing behind the bookcases that lined the wall of Jonathan's study. He peered through a crack in the boards, and there, beyond the books, were Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman. Mrs. Zimmerman had just con uh, conjured up a match out of thin air, and she was lighting a long, twisted cigar with it. She blew smoke out of both corners of her mouth. Well, now we know, she said. Yes, now we know. Jonathan's voice came from his leather armchair, where he sat slumped. All that Lewis could see of him was one blue-sleeved arm and a set of hairy knuckles grasping the chair arm. The question is, Jonathan went on, can we do anything about it? Mrs. Zimmerman began to pace. Cigar smoke trailed off behind her. She scraped the large purple stone of her ring along the whole length of a bookshelf. Do, she said, do, we fight them. What else? Jonathan gave a hoarse laugh. It made Lewis feel very uncomfortable. Easier said than done, Florence. They're both stronger than we are. You know that. We only fiddle around with magic. They gave their lives to it. As for her, 
She may have quite literally given her life for it. But why would they want to do what they're doing? said Mrs. Zimmerman, folding her arms and puffing angrily at her cigar. Why? This beautiful world. End it. Why? Jonathan thought a minute. Well, Florence, I, I can't really see into the workings of a mind like Isaac Izzard's, but I'd say the answer was scientific curiosity. Think of all that's been written about the last day. Graves opening, bodies rising up, fresh and new. Some think there will be a whole new earth, much better than the present one. Wouldn't you like to see that? And another thing occurs to me. Isaac and Selena Izzard didn't enjoy this world very much. Why shouldn't they try for the next one? Jonathan puffed on his hookah. There was silence for several minutes. And the clock, said Mrs. Zimmerman. I have to hand it to you. You were dead right. There is a real literal clock in these walls. He calls it a device, but it has to be a clock. He wasn't kind enough to tell us where it is, of course, though it seems to me he tells practically everything else. He even gives hints about where he hid the key. Not that that matters now. She broke her cigar in two and threw it into the fireplace. But there's one thing I'd like to know, she said, turning suddenly to Jonathan. Why did he need a clock to bring about the end of the world? Lewis gasped and put his hand over his mouth. Then it was going to be the end to bring about the end of that. Then it was going to be the end of the world after all. Because he lost the moment, Jonathan muttered. Sorry. Distracted by the dog. Because he lost the moment, Jonathan answered. The moment he had been seeking all those years. It was quite a search that old Isaac made. That's why he has all those crazy notes about mackerel skies and last judgment skies and clouds that look like chariots and trumpets and masks of doom. That was what he was after. A mask of doom. A day that would be right for his incantations. Sky magic is old stuff, as you know. The Romans used to... Yes, yes, cut in Mrs. Zimmerman impatiently. I know all about sky and bird divination. Who's got the D-Mag-A around here, anyhow? All right. So the right sky comes along for old droopy drawers. Fine. Dandy. So why doesn't he just wave his wand and turn us all into mully grubs? Because by the time he had made sure it was the right kind of sky, the sky had changed. It doesn't take long for clouds to move and change their patterns, you know. Or maybe he lacked the heart for it. It sounds silly, but I keep hoping that that was what, was, that, that was what held him off. Him? Lack the heart? Isaac Izzard? He was a hard man, Jonathan. He'd have pulled out his mother's teeth one by one if he had to have them for some devil magic. Jonathan sighed. Maybe you're right. I don't know. The important thing is that he did miss his opportunity. That's why he had to build the clock. To bring the time back. The exact time when everything was right and in its place. That's what he means when he talks about a device to redeem the time. Redeem indeed. He wanted to destroy us all. Mrs. Zimmerman was pacing again. All right, she said. All right. So he built the clock. Why didn't he just wind it up? He couldn't. Not all the way, at any rate. Didn't you read that passage? Jonathan got up and went to the library table where the papers were lying. He picked them up and leafed until he found the page he wanted. Ah, here it is. But when the device was completed, I found that I lacked the skill to wind it all the way up. I have tried, but I must conclude that one with greater power than I possess will be needed for the final adjustment. Curse the day she left me. Curse the day she went away. She might have done it. Jonathan looked up. In that last sentence... The word she is underlined four times. She, of course, is our friend across the street. Lewis closed his eyes. Mrs. O'Meager really was Mrs. Izzard then. 
He had guessed it, of course, but he hadn't been sure. Mrs. Izzard, and he had let her out. He felt like the stupidest, most foolish person in the whole world. Ah, uh, yes, said Mrs. Zimmerman, smiling wryly. Well, we shall see in the end who is stronger. But tell me one more thing, O oh sage, since it seems that you have been cast in the role of explicator and annotator of the testament of Isaac Izzard. Yes, what would you like to know, Florence? Well, he claims that the clock isn't wound all the way up, but it has been making a ticking sound for years now, a magic ticking that seems to be coming from behind every wall of this house. It's hard for me to believe that the clock is just whiling the time away until old Auntie Izzard arrives with her key. What is the clock doing? Jonathan shrugged. Search me, Florence. Maybe it's trying to drag the house back into the past without the aid of that final adjustment. Maybe he fixed it so the ticking sound would scare away anyone who might be foolish enough to come and live in this house. Isaac didn't want his clock found by accident and destroyed, after all. I don't know why the clock is ticking, Florence, but I do know this. When Mrs. Izzard, or whoever is over there, puts that key in the slot of that clock and finishes the job that Isaac started, then, at that moment, Isaac Izzard will return. You and I and Lewis will be ghosts, or something worse, and he will be standing there in the turret with power in his right hand, and the end of the world will come to pass. Lewis clamped both hands over his mouth. He fell to his knees, shuddering and sobbing. For a moment, he was on the verge of shouting, Here I am! Come and get me! So they would come and take him away and put him in the detention home for life. But he didn't shout. He clamped his hands more tightly over his mouth and cried in muffled bursts that shook his whole body. He cried for a long time, and when he was through, he sat staring listlessly at the dark wall of the passageway. Mrs. Zimmerman and Jonathan left the room. The fire burned low, but, Lu but Lewis still sat there. His mouth was full of the taste of ammonia, and his eyes burned. He took his handkerchief out of, the, out of the pocket of his bathrobe and blew his nose. Where was the flashlight? Ah, here it is. He clicked it on. Lewis got up slowly and started to pick his way toward the entrance. Even though he was walking upright, he felt as if he were slinking. Now he was running his hand over the splintery back of the china cupboard. He tripped the spring and the cupboard swung silently outward. Lewis half expected to see Mrs. Emmerman and Jonathan sitting there with their arms folded, waiting for him. But the kitchen was dark and empty. Lewis went up to his room. He felt as if he had stayed awake three nights in a row. Without even stopping to take off his bathrobe, he threw himself onto the rumpled bed. Darkness filled his brain, and he fell into a dead, dreamless sleep. Okay, so uh, Mrs. Izzard is back. She has the key. All she has to do is put in the clock and turn it and Isaac will come back and the world will be destroyed. Hmm. And Lewis is afraid to talk to Uncle Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman and let them know that he knows. And this is obviously what's been bothering Uncle Jonathan and making him angry, his worrying about Mrs. Izzard and the key in the clock. Now, what do you think is going to happen next? What would you do if you were Lewis? Like you to not just uh, talk about this with a friend, but I want you to write something down. What would you do if you were Lewis? Okay, several sentences what your plan would be, why that would be your plan, what you would hope would happen, and what you think might happen if things didn't go the way you hoped. Okay, so there's a writing assignment today. Enjoy it.